Let me open up in a word of prayer before we begin this morning. 89.1, and then let's open in prayer. Father, I come before you this morning. Asking you to let your spirit work in my life and in the life of those that are watching online, those that are here in the parking lot. That you would minister to us and allow us to know what intimacy with you looks like and means and how we uh, how we display that to a world that is watching. Grant us boldness. Increase our faith. And may we honor and glorify you this day. We ask all this in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. I'm going to give a, a preamble before my sermon this morning. I've titled the sermon, if, if you want to write this down, if you're going to take notes today, I've titled the sermon, A Book Out of Time. A Book Out of Time. And this and a preamble is basically words before the, the main subject matter. We have a preamble to the Constitution. And I'm going to give a preamble to this sermon. The, the first thing that I would say is, for example, in the, in the book of James, in the third chapter, in the second verse, in the first part of that, that second verse, James actually says these words. He says, for we all stumble in many ways. We all stumble in many ways. You stumble, I stumble. By the way, that word there, stumble, you, you can put in there sin. You sin, I sin. All of us but Christ Jesus sin. So I want to lay that as a precursor. The, the, what we're going to be talking about today, and by no means, is, is, is at least I'm hoping, I'm, I'm praying and have been praying that, that throughout this particular message that what you hear me say is, is not me in a, in a condemning kind of way, not me in a, in a judgmental way of pointing my finger and looking at you going, oh, you sorry individual. I'm wanting you to understand that this is a, a common playing field. You stumble in many ways, is what the passage said. You sin in many ways. I sin in many ways. All but Christ Jesus have sinned in many ways. But one of the things that I've communicated throughout the length of time that I've been here is that when we are Christ followers, we are not sinners who are saved by grace, but rather we are saints who choose to sin. And we all tend to still choose that sin. It is the battle within us all. It's that battle of that old man, that old nature, and what, what he does to pull us back into our old self and into the world systems. And yet, because you are in Christ, because Christ Jesus lives within you, because you are a, the temple of the Holy Spirit, because you are not your own, that you were bought with a price, because of this reality, if you have truly cried out and said, Lord Jesus, save me a sinner, then what you have is you've been promised the seal of the Holy Spirit and he is now in your life and he indwells you and you are now a new creation. You are now born again. And whereas once before your conversion, once before your salvation, you were a slave to sin and you had no ability whatsoever to resist the temptation for any length of time. Now that you are in Christ. You now have the Holy Spirit who allows you the ability to take every thought captive. You now have the Holy Spirit who is in you, who allows you to, to say, I will lean into Christ. 
I will draw near to God. And if I will draw near to God, God, then I'm able to have, not because of my strength, not because of my proficiency, not because of my abilities, but because of Christ in me, I now have the ability to, to resist the devil. And when I resist the devil, he then has to flee because I've drawn near to God. He is not fleeing because of me. He is fleeing because of the one in me. And he is fleeing from you because of the one in you if you are born again. So, so I'm saying these words as a, as, a, as a preamble. This message today is truly, really for those of you online or here in this parking lot, for those of you who say, I am a follower of Christ, this message is for you. This really is not a message. In this regard, it's not a message really for the lost world. Because the lost world, in this respect, they are lost. They don't know. They've never tasted the saving fruit of Jesus Christ. They do not have the supernatural in them to enable them to live a life of, of distinction. So this message that I'm preaching today is for those of you who cry out to me and say, I'm a follower of Christ. Now, again, it kind of is a preliminary message or a statement. I want you to also understand there's, I cannot, in a sermon, communicate every principle that has led up to this particular moment. I cannot communicate to you every thought of everything that I have researched along this way this week. I cannot share with you every thought that the Holy Spirit has conveyed to me and worked through. And so I, all I can do is do the very best I can to share with you what the Holy Spirit has been speaking to my heart about this particular week. That's the best I can offer you. It may be a frail opportunity. It may be a frail offering to give to you. But it's the best that I can give to you. And so if you would like to have more conversation with me, in other words, afterwards, then please. This is, this is my invitation to you to say, Scott, you know, you said some things that I didn't quite grasp. This is my invitation to you to say, come talk to me. Reach out to me. Because there may be things that I don't intentionally try to skip over a jump, but there's just not enough time in 30 to 40 minutes to communicate every thought. So sometimes I may accidentally make a preemptive jump. So as I say these words, I'm offering an opening up dialogue with you. The whole purpose of the book of 1 John, for example, and that's not where we're going to be. We're going to be, in, if you want to start turning to your scriptures, we're going to be in James chapter 1. You can begin turning to James chapter 1 as we talk about this book at a time. But the entire purpose of the book of 1 John is how do we, as followers of Christ, wrestle through the reality that we choose to sin, and yet we in Christ have no sin? <laughs> how do we wrestle through that? How do we work through this, what appears to be a contradictory concept? How do we do it? I would encourage you to read the book of 1 John and work through and wrestle through the, the issues and the points and the counterpoints that John writes. He writes it almost in a circular fashion as he writes through those five chapters of that 1 John. And I encourage you to go back and study and research it and say, what does it mean to be in Christ and to live victoriously and yet still battle that old sin nature? How do we do it? What is it like? Again, one last statement of preamble before we get to our points this morning. As I've already indicated, this message is actually for those who are in Christ. Now, maybe you are one that is here today in our audience that you've never received Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Maybe you're one in our listening audience and you've never uh, received Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I, I was literally just having a conversation in the back there just right before the service a moment ago. And somebody was sharing with me about a dear friend of theirs who, who passed away this week. Young young guy. And then in his sixties. And yet happened like this. Healthy, all of a sudden got an infection. It's passed. It's passed. Obviously the reason we're in parking lots is because of this whole COVID nineteen and now as a nation we've surpassed that hundred thousand people who have passed from COVID nineteen. Literally in a three-month time frame, just about. Maybe a little longer, but 
But you understand the point. There's 100,000 families that are around this nation who are sitting there saying, I did not expect 2020 to go this way. Life is brief. Life is short. And you are not promised tomorrow. You're not even promised the next hour or even the next minute. And I'm telling you, there is an eternity that is in front of you. There is, there is a judgment that stands before all of us. And we will either be as Christ followers before the Bema Seat of Christ, which means the, the mercy seat of God, or we will be before the and suffering in the lake of fire. And I'm just telling you, if you've never received Christ Jesus, his love is infinite, his mercy is vast. And there's literally nothing that you've ever done that could ever separate you from his love. He sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for your sins and for mine and for all of humanity. And he desires a love relationship with you. And so if you are here as this preamble kind of statement, if you've never received Christ Jesus, all you've got to do is cry out and say, Lord Jesus, save me a sinner. And he promises that he will. He will save you. He will redeem you. He will make you receive his mercy and his grace. These are the preliminary words, the preamble to our message. To help you understand why we're looking at this book out of time, the reason we're looking at this is because we finished up the sermon series during this COVID-19 process of, of essential. What is essential in our life? And then we said, okay, well, if we're, if we're going to look at what's essential in our life, why not look actually what is essential to be a follower of Christ Jesus? What are the doctrines that we as believers have to hold to to say, yes, I truly am a follower of Christ. In a modern day context, we use the word evangelical. In other words, one who believes that there is no other way to heaven except through Christ Jesus, because that's what Jesus says. And so last week, or two weeks ago, we, we talked about how we needed to believe. Belief is the foundation. And that we have to believe, and it's not just an intellectual acceptance of statements or words. It's, it's an, actually, it's a whole concept of every bit of who we are as individuals that we believe these principles these truths to be real not fiction not myth not imaginary but real and that we have to believe these things in order to be a follower of Christ because we experientially know Christ to be Christ we know Jesus to truly be the Savior. We've actually encountered him. We've spoken to him. We have a relationship with him. We speak to him. He speaks back to us. He guides our life. We obey his commands. And we live in union with him. So we have to believe this. Well, if we want to look at the principles of what actually is at stake, of what actually has to be believed, we have to say, okay, what, what is the foundation, if you will? What is the basis of our belief? And the basis of our belief is the Bible. At the end of the day, the Bible is the Holy Word of God. It is inspired. It is God-breathed. It's theonuspo. It's God-breathed. And so, because it is the Word of God, it is, it is God's love letter to you and to me of how to live in this world and also, not only just how to live in this world, but to how to know Him. So in other words, we cannot say, oh, I believe this, you know, I believe A, B, and C. I don't believe D because that actually, that, that offends me a little bit. But I believe E, F, and G. You, you know, we don't get a choice. In other words, if the Word of God is the Word of God, then there's no, it doesn't make a difference what your belief structure is. It's an irrelevancy. The Word of God is the Word of God, period. And so if we're going to say we believe, how do we know what to believe? We know what to believe because the Word of God tells us what to believe. That is why I've written this title as a book out of time. A book out of time. So let's work ourselves through James chapter 1, verses 19 through 25. First two points will be fairly short. At least I think they'll be fairly short. The last point is where we're going to spend most of our time. If you're taking notes this morning, your first point out of verse 19 to 20 of James chapter 1 is listen, listen to understand. In essence, if I'm telling you even right now as you are in this listen, listen to what I'm saying. 
Don't make a decision before you've gotten to the end of it. Listen to everything I say then, and then after you've heard everything I've said, then go home, be a good Berean. And what I mean by being a good Berean is in the book of Acts, there's a story where it's this, this city of Berea, where they heard what Paul said, and it says they then went home and they studied the scriptures to determine if what Paul said was true or false. So I'm telling you, listen to the entire argument of the sermon today. Listen to everything that I share. And then go home and study it for yourselves and determine for your own self, am I, Scott, right in what I'm saying? And if I am, you have a decision you have to make for yourself. And that is, what are you going to do with the Word of God? What are you going to do with this book out of time? So I say to you, the first point this morning is listen to understand. Look at me at James chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. James 1, 19 and 20 says this, This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. I think, I think this may be one of the biggest challenges to be a citizen of this particular country. I, I love being a citizen of the United States of America. It is still, in my opinion, the, the last bastion of, of hope in the sense, in the sense of, 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 of capitalism and economy. I'm not referencing in terms of faith. Because I just want you to understand the United States is not the savior of the world. Christ Jesus is the Savior of the world. There's only one hope for this world. There's only one thing that will save humanity, and it is Christ and Christ alone. It will not be the United States government. It will not be whoever is president. It will not be our Congress, and it will not be our judiciary. This is a great place, and I'm grateful for the privilege and the opportunity to live here. But this is not our salvation. And quite frankly, if you are in Christ, this is also not your home. You are an alien and a stranger here in this world, and you still live in this world. Your home is eternity with Christ Jesus. And you should have a longing, a desire, a burning to say, I will be the best ambassador and representative of Christ Jesus while I am here on this foreign soil. Beloved, believe me, this is a foreign soil to you and to me. Yes, I am grateful and I'm glad that this is where God, by his providential mercy and grace, allowed me the privilege to be born and to be raised. But this is not the end all. This is not the goal. My retirement in my bank account is not the end game. Christ is my end game. Okay? Now having said this, I think this verse right here speaks to the very problem that we as a nation have. Is we are a reactionary people. We are not an intellectual thinking people. We are a reactionary people. You offend me? I will raise up, I will bow up, and I will share with you my frustrations. Well, did we not see that even this particular weekend all across this nation? Was there an injustice that took place with a police officer who kneeled on the neck of, of, the, of, the, of James that, that then passed away? Is that an injustice? Absolutely. And it should be condemned. But does that then give us the right as individuals to say, ah, I will rise up and I will vandalize and I will steal and I will destroy? Is that the right response? And I'm telling you that if you are in Christ, the answer should be a resounding no. Because where does evil against evil produce ever the right? Instead, rather, as Christ followers, we need to listen, be slow to speak, quick to listen and don't let our response to be visceral in nature in other words to be full of pure emotion because more often than not i think james the reason he jumps to this anger issue is because when we are we reactive people i think more often than not this is the result we come out with and so what ends up happening is that in our anger we hurt and hinder the relationships that we have with people 
You've hurt my feelings. You spoke truth to me. I didn't like the words you said to me. So as a result, I will become angry. And in my anger, I will resolve and separate it. Again, just a few moments ago, I was having a conversation with somebody else that was talking about a relationship that they've had that was free. They had this relationship for years and years and years. Then there was a misunderstanding. There was a, there was a disagreement of sorts. And now, one of these, and these are both, these are both individuals that claim to be followers of Christ, and yet now one will not speak to the other. So I don't, I don't want anything to do with you. Where, beloved, where? Tell me. Where in the scriptures does it tell us that we as followers of Christ are, are two or that we are separated? The word of God tells us that we are one. We are one body in Christ. That we are supposed to be one with one another as Christ is one with the Father. So where when we become angry and offensive do we allow the, the visceral emotional baggage to, to wrap ourselves up to where we can say, ah, I can consider you as dead to me, and I will have nothing to do with you. And again, I want to emphasize, I am not talking about lost people here. I'm talking to you who say that you are a follower of Christ Jesus. The New Testament, the book of Acts, says that they called the church the way. The way. And the reason that the church got called the way was because the way that we acted was different than the way the lost world acted. But in the lost world, actually see a distinction in us, in Christ Jesus, when we harbor anger and resentment and frustration and bitterness and shame towards one another. I tell you, they cannot. And yet Jesus tells us in essence, he says, this is, the, this is my greatest ministry evangelistic outreach that I have is you all. You all being brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. You being brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, loving one another, reconciling with one another, saying, I realize that we have had offense. I realize that we have had challenges, but I would rather have the glory of God, the righteousness of God, which is what this passage says. I'd rather have the righteousness of God invested in seeing and displayed by a watching world than I would for my opinion to be right. What is at stake is the righteousness of God. We need to be slow to speak, quick to listen, to listen to understand. That leads us to our second point. And how this is for the lost world, quite frankly. What enables us to do this, what enables us to be able to listen, is that we must be born again by the word. We must be born again by the word. This is verse 21. It says, therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all remains of wickedness, in humility receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. What, what James is telling us is that you cannot do this work that I'm talking about. You cannot do this work of righteousness in your own strength. You can't be unified with each other in your own power. Because your sin nature wants to be on top. And your sin nature wants to over-exaggerate all of your goodness and amplify all of the wickedness in other people. But in Christ, if we are born again, if we have actually we put aside the filthiness and the remains of wickedness and in humility, in other words, the humbling of ourselves, our bowing before the Lord God and saying, I received the word implanted. By the way, that word there, word is logos. And logos is the very same word that's found in John chapter 1, which says, in the beginning was the logos, and the logos was with God, and the logos was God. This is a pure representation to the the, the fact that God is the Word. Jesus, the Logos, became flesh and dwelt among us. This is talking about how do we enter into a relationship. It is implanted in us. It is put inside of us. We are sealed with the Word, Jesus, God himself. And we are then saved. 
By the way, it's the same word that's oftentimes used in reference to the actual written word of God as well. The Logos is what is God-breathed, Dionustos. You have to be saved. If you're not saved, then this, this whole argumentation, this whole sermon that I'm preaching, it doesn't really apply to you. Let me just tell you, you can sit there and go, well, Scott, I don't want to live the life you're kind of telling me to live. But just understand that this life is short. This life is brief. Let's say you do make it to over 100 years of age in this life. That is still short and compared to eternity, which has no time. Which is forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And we so often focus on the short game that we miss the long game. The long game is forever. We must be born again by the word. And then this leads to our last point, which is the meat in the remainder of this sermon. We must be obedient to the word. Be obedient to the word found in James chapter 1, verse 22 through 25. James 1, 22 through 25 says this. It says, but prove yourselves doers of the word. Notice it prove yourself. In other words, you can't say it. It's not about what you, what you verbally give an assent to. There has to be proof in the pudding, if you will, using that old expression. There's got to actually be substance. But prove yourselves doers of the word, and not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in the mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But he who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, in other words, the word of God, and not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. So now we come to the crux of the point. The problem before us. The problem before us is sin. The problem before us is the sin for those of us in Christ. And when we are saints who choose to sin, how do we respond to that sin? That is is really what the issue is, and that is really the point of this particular sermon, is how do you respond to the sin you choose to commit in your life? James 4, 1 says it this way, he says, What is the cause of quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? What James is talking about is the tension that comes within a believer's life because of sin. And I use that word tension intentionally. In fact, I was, I was speaking to a pastor even this week about this very subject matter. And he was talking to me, he says, you know, Scott, he says, he said, I think the problem is, is there's a tension between God's word and the world's morality when it confronts us, and that tension is the problem. And then he goes on, he says to me, he says, the reason I use the word tension is because tension literally means stress. What happens in our life? And the reason why there's this, this the, why is there quarreling and fights among you? Do they not come from the evil desires at war within you? It's that war within you that is this tension. In other words, we come across the things of sin in this world but because of various reasons, and the reasons can be can be numerous. Sometimes it's because of families, because of loved ones. Sometimes it's because it's what we actually personally want to do. There can be all kinds of reasons why the tension exists. But when the tension between what the Word of God says and the world says, when they come to, con con to, con uh, to collide, when they 
hit each other and we are there in the midst of it and we're trying to determine, okay, how will I respond in this situation? That's where the tension comes in. And James tells us this is what's causing all the issues between us. Because what we end up doing so often, especially as Christ followers, and this is a shame, I've been guilty of it, you've been guilty of it, we've all been guilty of it from time to time, but the issue is, now you're back to 1 John, is this a habitual problem? Is this a problem that we run into and we continually, time and time again, habitually fall into that pattern and say, oh, I'm going to compromise what the Word of God says, and I'm going to live in the constraints and the confines of the sin of this world and make justifications and rationale and acceptance of what is going on in the world system to appease the conscience and the turbulence that I have within when it's confronted by the Word of God. And I'm just telling you, beloved, at the end of the day, you don't have a choice. If you say, I am a follower of Christ Jesus, if you say, Christ Jesus is Lord of my life, if that is your commission, if that is your claim, if that is what you say you believe, then you have no course of conversation with the Father in regards to issues that he has made abundantly clear. This is the realm of sin. This is the realm of righteousness. Narrow is the road that leads to life, and very few find it. But broad is the road that leads to death, and many there are that find it. You have no course. You cannot say, oh, but God told me it's okay. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. Because the word of God is spoken. And the word of God is the word of God. It is the standard by which we believe. It is the standard by which we live our lives. It is the standard by which we live and breathe and live out our lives before a world that's watching. And they want to see, are you different? Why do you think the church has so little impact in a world? Because they hear us come out here, they hear us preach things like this, they hear us say things like this, and then they watch us live like the world lives. And they say, why should I follow you when you're doing the very same thing that I'm doing? Why should I give up my Sunday mornings when I'd rather be out fishing? Why should I give up my time when you're no better than me? And it's because we do not let the word of God become the standard. We have no we have no choice. You don't have to like what the Word of God says. You don't even have to personally agree with what the Word of God says. But what you do have to do is accept what the Word of God says by faith and then obey it. And beloved, you're not going to do it perfectly. That's the whole point. That's what First John is all about. If you say you have no sin, then you're a liar. That's what First John is all about. But what also First John tells you, but you can't remain in sin. And then say, oh yes, I'm a follower of Jesus. This is all good. It's hunky dory. I love Jesus, but I'm going to stay in my sin. The Holy Spirit has come to do three things. He's come to judge for sin, righteousness, and judgment. So he's just, he, he convicts us of righteousness when we are actually living out the promises of the scriptures. When we're actually living out the obedience of what the word of God says. And our lives are now a reflection of his glory. That we are actually light in the midst of darkness saying this is the way. Walk in it. And when we live that kind of life, the Holy Spirit convicts our heart and says, yes. This is what my children are supposed to look like. This is what my children are supposed to act like. This is how we're supposed to be. But if we chart to compromise, if we falter when the battle is raging with inside of us, when we're no longer an effectual doer, but just a hearer of the word, then the Holy Spirit comes in and he starts to convict us of sin. You know, the question then comes down to what will you do? What will you do? How would you respond to the Holy Spirit's conviction of sin in your life? Because you've got a choice. The choice is that you say, I am a follower of Christ, and I will humble myself before him, and I will bow the knee, and I will say, Lord God, I am sorry. And that is called contrition. Contrition is an actual display of remorse before the Father, saying, this is not what I wanted. This is not who I wanted to be. Please, and then, and then it's, please forgive me. 
and walk this out with me. For some of you, whatever the sin is that you have found yourself in battle with, it can be an ongoing process. And what you're doing is you're gaining victory at incremental levels because the Holy Spirit is saying, my grace is sufficient. And so you walk it out moment by moment, breath by breath, day by day, second by second. And you're walking it out and you're bringing glory to the name of God as you wrestle through and fight through and humble yourself before the Lord God. And say, day in, day out, God, give me your grace, give me your strength, give me your sufficiency. This is all about being a person of integrity. John Maxwell says it this way, a person with integrity does not have divided loyalties. That's called duplicity. In other words, you cannot say, oh, I, I want to love the world and I want to love God. That's an impossibility. In fact, James, in chapter 4, verse 4, he says this way, he says, therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. You can't have it both. You can only have one allegiance, one loyalty. Is it to him or is it to the world? Is it to yourself? Who is your loyalty? And so Maxwell says, a person with integrity does not have a divided loyalty. That's duplicity. Nor is he or she merely pretending. In other words, we can't just come up here, especially like if I'm, I'm, I'm on a stage here, so I'm looking at our band's equipment. You cannot come up here as a band member and pretend on Sunday morning, oh, I love Jesus. Let me sing with all of my heart to Jesus. And then on Monday morning, go out and start living as a carnal Christian. That is duplicity. I mean, excuse me, that is hypocrisy. That is hypocrisy. He or she is not merely pretending. People with integrity are whole people. And that's the whole issue. Is are you who you claim to be in private as well as in public? Because Christ Jesus is with you everywhere you are. He's with you in your private place. He's with you in your personal life. And your personal life ought to be a reflection of what your public life is. Or actually, I should say your public life should be a reflection of what your personal life is. How many times have I said to you all that when we come together like this on a Sunday morning, that this is a corporate context of us giving back out of the overflow of what the Holy Spirit has done in our life all week long. That is what this is all about. This is where this tension of stress comes in. James 4, 6 says it this way. He says, but he gives us even more grace to stand against the evil desires. You and I have the capacity, not in and of ourselves, but because of Christ who is in us, to be able to stand and say, I choose Christ. And I draw in, I lean in to him. Can a lost world truly see a distinction in your life? Can a lost world truly say, you know, when I look at them and when I observe them, when I see what they put on, on social media, when I see them in private at the grocery store when no one else is looking and they don't even know that I'm looking at them and I'm watching them from another aisle and I'm kind of just peering over and looking at them. When I'm examining their life, is their life the same? Or do we put on a front? Do we put on a, a facade? If we are in Christ, if we are in Christ, then the word of God has to be our standard. And he says, don't be mere hearers of the word, but be effectual doers of the word. Father, be merciful. To us. Help us to be obedient followers. None of us will do this perfectly, Lord, but it's not an issue of perfection. It is an issue of humbling and obeying. It is an, it's an issue of a right heart of saying, I am sorry, God. I want to walk in obedience with you. Your word is our standard. 
It's what we live under. We ask this in Christ Jesus' name. Amen.